Hey, what's going on guys? I wanted to take the opportunity to talk to you about drawing a pistol. Look, I always feel obligated when I put out any content and that content is misrepresented and mostly trolls, but sometimes normal people come out of the woodwork and they go, why would you ever do that? Or I would never do that. That's not what experts do without understanding the context of who I am. Like I'm not a big deal, but I am an experienced trainer, operational guy, the list goes on. So let me tell you first and foremost, this came from me doing a reels. Like Instagram has this feature where you do a video similar to what TikTok is. And I did a draw stroke video. I shouldn't say it like that, but I did a draw video where I'm drawing the pistol and presenting it, something like this. And this. And guys were like, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. And nobody understood the context. So let me explain. And by the way, this isn't a defensive response to trolls. This is reinforcing education and the right context. Uh, I don't ever want to put anything out there into the world just willy nilly without paying attention. So the first thing is, let's talk about my background. I'm a career special operations guy. Four years in the infantry, the rest of my time in special operations. I was a commander's and extremist force guy, meaning I did direct action, special reconnaissance most often my entire military career. Even in specialized units, I was a reconnaissance guy. I did technical recon, physical recon, sniper reconnaissance, whatever. So I have a baseline in operations. It's not where I learned pistol everything, but it's where I had a baseline. Now I transition and I'm a federal firearms instructor for Flet C, meaning every agency I could qualify because I'm a federal law enforcement trainer. Um, I'm also uh, qualified in my interagency job working as a contractor to do a whole bunch of things like train specific people, qualify them, but also operate in austere environments via my job that I did in that contracting world. I also am post certified across several states and I train law enforcement for a living. So a lot of people ask me like, Mike, why do you have that belt set up? Well, most often I have this belt set up because I train law enforcement officers. Remember, if you're a civilian and you have an overt carry, it's likely you're not going to carry that way normally. It's just holding your pistol conveniently. Yes, there is a worst case scenario where you clip it together and you have that set up. But most often you need to be carried from concealed, appendix carry, or wherever you're carrying. So I carry a VTAC belt, which is an older belt. I've had this belt since I was a team sergeant over a decade ago. And it has a Cobra belt on the inner piece. It's a Brokos belt, which is the type of model it is. And I have some old kit on here. My basic hemorrhage response kit, which is my med kit, stop the bleed. I have a Winkler knife right here. I have my Philcraft survival tourniquet holder with a Cat 7 tourniquet. I have a Safari Land ALS with a Glock 17 in it. A Safari Land ALS has a locking mechanism right here that you have to push down with your thumb to unlock it, which keeps the pistol retained. On this side, I have pistol mags, carbine mags, and I also have a dump pouch and a utility pouch that has a Gerber multi-tool in it. So this is for breacher, uh, breaching, maybe explosive charges, shotgun rounds, whatever it is. Most often on the range, it's used to hold my spare magazines that I used and are empty. Uh, maybe markers, maybe whatever you have, whatever you're into. So this is my routine setup. So let me show you one of the first problems that was brought up or brought to my attention. Let me show you the demonstration of what I was doing on video. So that's the first problem I got. Why are you pulling the trigger? Why is your finger on the trigger? That's a good way to shoot yourself. So let me explain. One, my finger wasn't on the trigger until I was aligned. If you went back in slow-mo and you slowed it down, you would see that. But let me slow-mo it for you. Hands on the gun. Why is my hand on the gun prior? Because I'm getting a free rehearsal out of the draw stroke by touching my gun and removing my hand. Because I'm literally reverting back to that same movement. It's similar to what you would do in a USPSA match. We say, shoot ready, stand by, beep, and your arm goes straight down. So I encourage law enforcement officers and civilians that I'm teaching to take advantage of that opportunity and that free rep, where if you just touch the gun and you release the hand, you're creating a neural auto bond to race to the gun to have the positioning correct. 
Another thing I'm doing is drawing down on the gun before I release it. A draw stroke should never be pulling the gun out without an acquired grip. That's pulling the gun out. That's an acquired grip. So my hand in slow motion is coming down, acquiring a grip, pushing down on the gun, and then pulling the gun out. Okay? Next is as I align the gun with the target, you, you're the target. When I draw the pistol in slow motion, I'm not prepping the trigger until my hand and the gun are aligned with the target and I'm pushing forward on the gun. That's when I'm prepping the trigger. I actually had one person say, why would you ever put your finger on the trigger unless you intend to use it? Well, I created the damn scenario. I, mean, I intend to use it. I'm also not a police officer and neither are you if you're a civilian. So if you're practicing draws where you draw and then your hand and your finger indexed on the side of the gun, then you're practicing a habit that will set you up for failure. Because if you draw the pistol and you come out and then you do this when you're reacting to an immediate threat, meaning a threat that's presenting itself to you, a gun pointed at you like that, then you're not going to, you're going to go this and then you got to do that. Well, it's too late. It takes me or takes the average person about two tenths of a second to break the shot in your direction. Another thing that I got grossly criticized was the positioning of my support hand. It's a good way to shoot your hand. Oh, man. So look, I grew up in special operations where we shot pistols. In special operations, when you drive your hand to a, a... The pros do this too, by the way. When you drive your hand to a gun, your support hand needs to be mated with your gun-holding hand, your dominant hand in most cases, that's drawing up towards the target. I'm not flagging my hand. I'm setting the position. So... Position one, position two, position three, and I'm driving in my hand. At no time was I flagging my hand. Another person responded about, why is your support hand on your chest? And a lot of people um, go back and forth with this. Listen, if you're shooting one-handed, there's a specific reason you are. It could be a time constraint. It could be you didn't think about it. It could be your hand's wounded. But if you take your hand and you just flop it down on the ground, it's nowhere near your support hand. So let's say you're bladed and you're, you're going to draw your pistol and you come out and you're doing this. Why would you put your hand here? When I learned in special operations for guys that were more operationally experienced than me, was if your hand has a tactile plant or anchor, then it gives you the feeling that your hand's on the gun versus flopping around where your brain's thinking about where your hand's at and it's neglecting it while thinking through processes. When it, when if it's pinned here and you start here, it's easy to transition to a support hand here. Again, a tactic. And even in offhand shooting, doing this and setting yourself up this way is a preferred tactic than letting your uh, hand flop around. The next criticism was, too bad you gotta look at your holster too bad you, you have to look at your holster every single time you put your gun away. That's pretty sad. So let me demonstrate. So I don't have to look at my holster. But I'm a trainer and educator before anything. I've been in gunfights. I've been in a lot of gunfights. Here's what I'll educate you on. If you're shooting a gun from an overt belt and you're out in the fight, when are you going to put your gun away? And I tell my guys on the range, and I tell my guys uh, who are in law enforcement and military the same. When are you putting that gun away? Well, if you're putting the gun away, I, I jokingly say, I need to get a letter from Congress. Um, I need to get a letter from my mom letting me know that the, gun, the, the gunfight's over. The war is done. Put the gun away. Because I'm not in a race to put the gun away. But you might be. So in my flat ranges, when I teach and train, we never do this and race back to the holster. We never do that. Why? Because you're building a bad habit. Even doing this and then coming back like this, bad habit. Because when you're in the fight and you create the rep and the script that you're drawing the pistol, aligning the pistol, and breaking the shot, and you create a trigger moment doing this, that's a bad habit. Most often, and I just saw it this weekend, of one of the worst habits you could build is this. 
I've seen guys in my training courses all the time do the same exact thing. Loaded gun, draw, fire one shot, bring the gun back and press check it. You know why? Because they're not press checking it, they're recycling it in operation to reset the trigger to get another dry practice. So you should put something to break the breech to allow you to squeeze the trigger as much as you want or get a cert gun or a sim gun. But practicing that will set you up for failure. So if I'm in a gunfight and the gunfight's over, what I tell guys is to look at the holster. Why? It's the same exact argument for if you're doing a slide lock reload. Look, I've been slide lock with my carbine in combat. When I was slide lock, I sought cover and I dealt with the problem. The problem is the gun being down, not the bad guy's expression or disposition. The problem is your gun's down. So every competent firearm guy, unless there's a creative argument I've never heard, will tell you the same. When you draw a pistol, and if you're slide locked, meaning locked to the rear with no bullets in the gun, or maybe even a malfunction of the gun, the priority is the gun, not downrange. Because if I look at the magwell one time, that is enough to transition this magazine into the gun with one single movement versus it doing it blindly, where I'm looking at the target. One, if I have a slide lock in the middle of a pistol gunfight, I'm moving off the X. Movement is synonymous with survival. But if I'm slide locked, I'm looking down at the problem, getting the gun up, and then getting back in the fight. It's the same argument for why I would look at my holster and not look at the fight. If the fight is over, let's say the fight's not over and there's a chance of contact, then why would I put my gun away? Why would I ever... look? If I'm doing this and I'm moving back to cover and I'm transitioning to my pist from pistol to carbine, I'm getting behind walls, barricades, or whatever it is, looking at the holster, putting it away, and getting my carbine up. But at no circumstance should you put your gun away when there's still a chance of a fight, right? So if I'm up, I'm out, I'm concentrated on the fight, the fight's over, I want you to look down at your holster one glance, finger off the trigger, and put the gun in your holster. One, that's how I train. Because if people are coming off of a sympathetic nervous response, they have adrenaline and cortisol, even for operators and special operations ha have this sympathetic nervous response, they're going to be reacting differently or acting differently um, than they would normally in a parasympathetic uh, response. So their elevated heart rate might be enough for them to do something they're not thinking about. I train thousands of people every single year and I see it all the time on Rangers. When we move and we shoot, I make every one of my students look down at your holster, finger off the trigger, and put it away. Why? Because I want them to look at where they're placing the gun. Another additional argument, this is probably part two of this, is that most gunfights for civilians happen at night. Same with law enforcement officers. So, yes, it might be advantageous for you to understand where your holster is at, but if you're putting the gun away, the fight's over. That holster for you won't likely be here. It will be here. So when you lift your shirt and you go to stuff your gun, I've seen the accidental discharges, even in top-tiered communities of people having ADs because they're trying to fight through material, when if they just took one look, they could have put it away. Look, guys, I like taking people's questions and then answering those questions. In this case, I took a whole bunch of trolls' comments, which... I felt like an insecure question they didn't want to ask, so they just popped off at the mouth. But look, I am not putting out anything in the world without the experience, defining the why, and the education to make sense of it. If I'm doing this, it's because I'm representing myself and other special operations guys until I hear differently. There are arguments. If Kyle Lamb called me right now and said, Mike, I actually have a circumstance where that wasn't going to work, I would listen I would reinstitute it into my training protocol and redisseminate it through my guys, through Raul and all the guys. I want to make sure that you guys are always prepared. And being prepared starts with good training. But good training comes from good trainers. Um, the trainers that we have on the training side with Raul Martinez are the best trainers in the world. It's funny and it's ironic. Recently, I heard a guy who was pretending to be a Green Beret criticized the guys in my company. He said, 
Mike and Kurt are OGs, but there's guys pretending to be nothing they're not. If you work for Fieldcraft Survival, you are the subject matter expert, and you're not pretending to be anything you're not because we don't have anybody like that. And it's ironic that a couple days or a couple weeks later, it comes out that he was representing himself to be a Green Beret, and he wasn't even in combat. I mean, he claimed PTSD, and he didn't even have PTSD because he was never in combat. So be careful and be cautious of the person who in tactics says they're the end-all, be-all solution. I am not the end-all, be-all solution. I have a narrow uh, focus career field and profession that I've lived, that I've, that I've lived decades of my life in, but that doesn't mean I know everything. If tactics is not an open form of discussion and learning, be cautious of that guy. Also be cautious of the loudest one in the room. It's often the loudest, mo most egotistical, the one who thinks he has the sole solution, who doesn't know his ass from his elbows. So I thought I'd leave you with that, and I hope you guys have a good day. Peace.